Outrocast. Absolute pleasure to connect. And am I correct that Pennies from Heaven is the latest single, or has there been one single since then? There's been another single, um, but not for me. And now the full album is out. So full album came out May 26th. It's tough to know what's qualifying as a single these days <laughs> because it used to be it had to be worked at radio and it had to be on MTV or something like that. And nowadays it's I put it up on Spotify. It's a single. Do you care about singles or I get the vibe you're still an album artist? I am. I, I think that's true of most jazz musicians, but I think there are quite a number of us now trying to embrace this new paradigm of digital streaming and I mean, in some ways, it's really exciting because while we may have misgivings about Spotify and Apple Music and Amazon Music, all that stuff, um, you know, it's it's you get to reach many more ears, even if you're making a bit less money. It's exciting to have direct access to so many potential fans. Mm -hmm. um, so I've tried to to embrace it, but but the release strategy looks so different and. Yeah. Right. And often people are confused, especially if there's a longer release timeline. So, so, you know, and I've had arguments with fellow musicians about this, like, is it better to just release two singles a couple of months before the full album release? Or should you do what is now being recommended, which is the waterfall release where you release singles for several months before the full album drops. And the whole thing has basically been nearly the whole thing has been shared before it's officially out as a collection. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it kind of steals the thunder of the full album release, right? That's I think that's the trade off. Yeah, well, yeah. you answered indirectly another question of mine. I was going to say, do you still like to be called a jazz artist? And I say that because you've hit upon different genres, yeah. and your music isn't. It's not bebop. It's not smooth yeah. jazz. It's hard to qualify what it is. And some people yeah. go, "Oh, I'm not jazz. Don't call me jazz." But you like the jazz tag still. I do. Yeah, it's a big part of my formative years, my formation as an artist, and I don't think it'll ever leave me. And it's it's something that I wear proudly. I I, I mean, jazz musicians who've gone deep uh, into the tradition, and actually there's a whole dialogue and debate happening about just the label jazz um, from Black American musicians in particular. They want it to be called Black American music. Um, so you'll see the hashtag BAM in regards to, to <laughs> conversations around jazz, which I think is cool. Yeah. But anyway, um, yeah, so I definitely embrace the jazz label. Uh, and on this album, on your request, it's pretty overtly jazz of some kind. Whereas with Out of Dust and the self-titled release from back in 2018, which was mostly original content, that that really straddled jazz and something other. And in mm -hmm. fact, the, we call them the jazz police. A lot of the jazz police would not allow that you know music within its boundaries and that's okay because i i've always felt that the genre has forward momentum it sort of reaches into new territory by its nature um so in that sense i always felt that i was still honoring jazz even if i was stepping a little outside of the box do you own the domain jazzpolice.com <laughs> sure. we have to look it up and see if it exists it's hilarious yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, with in terms of jazz, the, the point that you're making is very true because when Rod Stewart did his great American song, but mm. serious, people are calling that jazz. You go, there is nothing jazz about that. And then Snarky Puppy, who I'm a big yeah, fan of. Me too. Some people are like, that's not jazz. Are you kidding right. me? That's um, it's like prog rock that has horns and changes time signatures a lot. Yeah, and I guess it's it, it boils down to the big question, what is jazz, right? Yeah, I don't and know. I know, and I don't think any of us, I mean, there's definitely like a an encyclopedic definition or or Merriam-Webster dictionary definition. Um, and of course, the historians of the genre would have a specific take on that, I think. Um, and it's not to discount that, but, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I I feel that Snarky Puppy so much of that music has the, the the tenets, the foundations that make jazz what it is. So spontaneity, interaction, yeah. improvisation, you know, a, a, a sophisticated harmony. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of elements there. And I think enough to have it be, if not jazz, jazz adjacent. 
And what I love about them and Jacob Collier and Becca Stevens and some people who you might call jazz adjacent, what I love about those artists is that they're pulling people who would call themselves jazz skeptics back into the fold. And that's good. So to me, we're missing out if we try and exclude Snarky Puppy and Jacob Collier for the sake of some sort of definition that's more narrow. Um, and I, I would like to be, I would prefer to be part of what they're doing. <laughs> and yeah. I see it as kind of the renaissance of, of the genre. And again, it's in the spirit of jazz, right? So even yeah. if it isn't jazz, it's in the spirit of the genre and therefore is at, 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 very, at the very least um, a cousin. A close cousin. <laughs> so you not only have to buy jazzpolice.com, you have to buy jazzskeptics.com and jazz adjacent. Jazz, jazz adjacent. Yeah, yeah that's, I kind of love it. We overuse that term, but I like it. It sounds kind of smart and it, it's very clear in what it means, right? Right. Well, in addition to this great new album of yours, I'm going to be in Fredericton, Canada as a guest of the city, and you're playing the Harvest Music Festival. Now, when we see you live out there, is it mostly about your requests or is it stuff from throughout your career that you'll be playing? Throughout my career. So we just got back from a tour of Europe that ended in Ronnie, at Ronnie Scott's in London, which is kind of a legendary jazz club. Yeah, yeah so that was really cool. And of course we wanted to showcase your requests, the new music, but we found that it worked so well to couple that repertoire with my original songs and the storytelling that is always a big part of the shows that I share, mm -hmm. um, especially where original songs are concerned. And I have much less to say about jazz standards, even though I love that music and I honor it and the stories behind the composers, songwriters, et cetera, are, are I'm sure remarkable. Um, and that is something I explore quite a bit as a radio host, mm -hmm. but as a performer, you know, I would rather let those songs almost be palate cleansers. And then we get to the original material, which will be less familiar for most of those attending the show in Fredericton, but has a bit more heft and depth, um, mm -hmm. in terms of who I am as a musician and, um, and just the, the inspiration that drives me. So it's a real nice compliment, the two together, both sides. So not a solo performance, full band performance there in Fredericton? Oh yeah, I'm actually flying, I'm, I'm bringing in the big guns. So I'm, I'm flying my band, my husband and uh, drummer Ben Whitman, co-producer of the past four albums that I released. Mm -hmm. He's coming in with me, so that's a real treat. And then George Kohler, who I think is a Canadian icon. Uh, he's an incredible bassist. He's going to join us as well. Hmm. Fredericton, is that a city that you have, and it's okay if the answer is no, but is that a city that you have history with? Yeah. So, I mean, not extensively, but I've played there a couple of times. And in fact, one of my first tours uh, in the early 2000s brought me to Moncton and Fredericton. And, uh, and I just, I just remember it. I remember walking around sort of this elevated boardwalk and you'd look down and there was all yeah. this sort of froth on the ocean and just kind of drinking. I, I love Atlantic Canada. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm from BC mm -hmm. and I love the Pacific and I love the coastal rainforest, but there's something about Atlantic Canada that just gets me in the gut. <laughs> I get and it. I know it reaches back to a band trip that I took in high school to St. John's and Truro of all places, Nova Scotia. And then, so when we were back out East um, and enjoying, uh, you know, that was the Capitol Theater in um, Moncton, mm -hmm. and I think it was the Imperial the Playhouse or probably. the Playhouse. Yeah. yeah, yes, that was it. In uh, in Fredericton, it just it just brought me back to that same feeling. Um, so I always crave going back, and and then I got to play what was before Harvest Jazz and Blues Festival, now Harvest Music Festival, um, mm -hmm. with uh, Phil Dwyer in the mix. He's a really great saxophonist, and uh, he actually studied law there, so he was pursuing his legal certification <laughs> while you know moonlighting as a jazz musician and it was a double bill um with oh my goodness at uh, david miles so that was oh. really fun yeah and and i can see why harvest jazz and blues is now harvest music because again I, they don't want to limit themselves to sort of the stricter these stricter genres yeah 
And it was such a fun pairing with David Miles. Like I thought he's such a different artist. And yet there was a real simpatico and we've been vowing ever since to co-write, but we just haven't made it happen yet. So who knows? Next that'll happen. Album. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, you mentioned British Columbia before BC. I find that one out of every three interviews that I do of the 15, 20 interviews I do a week all has a BC tie, whether they make the album there, they make the movie there, the person's originally from there, the person used, used to live there. Like yesterday I was talking to the composer, Bad Sisters, the Sharon Horgan show. Mm -hmm. BC guy. Uh, I hey. I have a book coming out about David Lee Roth. He made his third third album in BC because of Bob Rock and all that. So, hey. did you, when did you start to notice that BC was like the secret entertainment capital of the world? Well, you know what's so interesting. So, what I would say, and this is true of the jazz scene, I think, but it may extend to the music scene at large. Somehow, musicians in BC are less prone to kind of pander to these preconceived ideas about what their music should sound like. And, and so like some of the most creative jazz comes out of Vancouver and the surrounding areas, because it's like the musicians are like, we don't, we don't care. We don't care if this works for the jazz police in Toronto or wherever. Right. They, and I would say, you know, I mean, again, this could, this really would apply to anywhere across our beautiful country, but there is something about the landscape and the views on the coast there that just, I think it inspires something really special. Um, and who knows what that is. And, 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 and it's probably similar in terms of Eastern Canadian musicians. I think there's, you know, maybe a bit of a tie there because I think a lot of the Great creative music also comes out of Eastern Canada. And of course, I mean, Quebec, the prairies, everywhere. But there's something, they always say there's something in the water when they talk about BC musicians. <laughs> well, my, my last question to you has nothing to do with your request. Plug, plug, great album, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, when, and whenever I talk to somebody from BC, related to BC, I like to ask, did you have any tie-ins with Brian Adams in your career? Oh my gosh. Be be because Brian Adams, you know, he co-wrote on some Kiss records. He built that studio. I think it's called The Warehouse where ACDC and Metallica and Motley Crue, all that happened. All these jingles happened around there or Little Mountain. And, you know, and then there's Bob Clear Mountain. In other words, all this pop, jazz, metal music history all happened. And Brian Adams is always one degree removed from it. And the, it, the answer is no. I don't know the guy. That's cool, too. <laughs> I don't know him personally, but I will say that when I was in high school, I think it was high school. When did Robin Hood come out with Kevin Costner? 91. 92. Good, good for you. That's a, you got a steel trap for a memory there. If, um, if it's one of the five topics I care about, yeah. it, it goes in there and you <laughs> fall into that category and the rest of it. Oof. That's so great. So, <laughs> so when that movie dropped and caused a huge stir and of course every teenage girl was obsessed with everything I do, sure. I do it for you. yeah 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 so so that really that was really my introduction to Brian Adams and then when I was an usher at uh, Massey Hall in Toronto oh. which was my first real job like I was a referee a soccer ref when I was 12 and I worked at Baskin Robbins you know at the local Capilano Mall in BC like uh, in Vancouver and uh, I had a few kind of small jobs, but my first real job was ushering at Roy Thompson Hall and Massey Hall. And it was awesome. I got to see all kinds of shows and I was paid to be there. And, and Brian Adams was one. I just remember him like head to toe in white, including like glistening white kids. But he says, yeah. took us off. I mean, the, the man yeah. is talented, you know? Totally. He's talented. <laughs> <laughs> and you look at the impact that him and Jim Valance had on pop music. And Jim yeah. Valance is kind of that like ghost where no one knows what he looks like. <laughs> no one knows where he is. But there's a song by Jim Valance playing in your whatever city you're in right now on the radio. Probably. Right, right, right. That's amazing. Well, I love that you go deep and you, you know, you, you connect with the people that don't necessarily get as much airtime, right? That are like the people behind the songs. Totally. Well, hey, I am looking forward to that gig of yours in Fredericton. Thank you for the many years of great music. Hope another album comes soon and just keep up all the greatness out there. 
Oh, thanks. I'm super excited to come back to Fredericton and hopefully we'll get to meet in person. Outrocast.